Good morning, everyone. I, I confess to you, I come with a heavy heart today. This is a, a difficult passage, a difficult text that we are going to unpack together. We are talking about something that we don't like to talk about because, well, loneliness is tough. I, I want you to think about, we have, have lonely people in our lives. Some of you have aging parents, some of you have aging grandparents, some of you have people you know that don't get out much. And as we look at God's word today, we're going to try to work our way through two questions. First of all, why are we lonely? Second, we're going to do our best to see how does knowing Christ combat that loneliness? How does, why are we lonely? That's the first thing we'll ask together. And then how does knowing Christ combat that. And now the trouble is with preaching a topical sermon is that everyone has ideas about loneliness. It, you know, so many of us have felt lonely. So we all have opinions on loneliness. We, we all think we know what it is, young foolish preachers included. We, we all think we have some grasp on this nature, this part of what it means to be made in the image of God and what it means to live in a fallen world. It's not like preaching about elephant poachers in Africa because poaching elephants in Africa, I'm sure, is something no one in our congregation has ever done, which means doesn't matter what we say about such things, doesn't affect us. But one thing that affects every human being whether surrounded by people or by themselves, whether in a big family or small family, big church or small church, is loneliness. And so, with God's help, let's find out today why we're lonely and look to the hope that knowing our Lord, our God, and our Savior brings to that. So first, let's define the slippery creature we call loneliness. Loneliness is not being alone. Loud and clear, friends, loneliness is not being alone. You know, Jesus went away to solitary places to pray. Time and time again, we see our Savior going to mountains, going to plains, retreating from his, his crowd of people, or even from his disciples, and going to be with his Father in prayer. That is not loneliness. That is the gift of being alone, or the gift of being solitary. Because that building of relationship and that beautiful gift of prayer is what Christ is doing. He's not just throwing, pushing everyone away, and locking himself in one small box to pray. He is going to be with his Father. The second thing, and hear this loud and clear, loneliness is not sinful. Loneliness in itself is not sinful. However, it is a result of the fallen and sinful world we live in. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 2, and we're going to see how all of that works together. But I, loud and clear, loneliness is not sin. How easy it is if we are feeling lonely, if we maybe don't have someone at home anymore, if our family has moved away, to think, I'm lonely. What's wrong with me? Everyone else seems to be doing well. Everyone else seems to have family come visit or to be content being by themselves. Why am I feeling bad about being lonely? Well, as I said, loneliness is not sin. But it is a consequence of sin. Either our own, perhaps we have done wrong, or living in this fallen world. So we're going to define loneliness in this way. And I wish I had PowerPoint so we could copy it down together, but that's okay. We'll define loneliness in this way. When the relationships we have, whether that be with a friend or a loved one, don't measure up to what we expect them to be. It's when the relationships we have don't measure up to what we expect them to be. Simple example, let's say you're, let's say you're married. You expect as a loving husband for your darling saint of a wife to have supper ready at 5.30 every single day. Without fail, forget about the weather, forget about what we have in the fridge for leftovers, 5.30 on the dot. 
I also expect to back rub every two weeks, but that's besides the point. So when, when your wife, as amazing and virtuous as she is, gets supper on the table at 545, what happens? You, you, you think and you say, what's brought about this change? What, what's caused this to not meet my expectations? And what happens when my back rub gets missed? What happens when laundry isn't done? What happens when she won't tell me how she's feeling when she usually does? What happens when there's a change in relationship where what we expect to happen doesn't measure up? What happens when your best friend stops talking to you for a week and a half? What happens when they're not as engaged in conversation? That the relationship you have is not measuring up to what you expect. Larry always used to tell me how his marriage was going. He always used to tell me how his walk with the Lord was, but now we're talking more about golf than what really matters to Larry. Relationship, what we expect, is not, not measuring up. So imagine this. Let's say it's a much nicer day out and a stranger walks in. We'll call that stranger Kevin. Kevin comes into the church and being the warm and welcoming church we are, we see Kevin, we're like, we've never seen Kevin before. So we all run to greet Kevin. It's like, hi, Kevin, how are you doing? And we talk him all the way into the sanctuary. Kevin sits down, probably somewhere with other people. And Kevin worships with, with us. Kevin eagerly prays with us. He hears the word of God. He's scribbling down notes. He is so engaged with what is going on in church. He comes to potluck. We make sure he goes through first. He leaves with two helpings of dessert. We, we do our job to welcome Kevin. But when Kevin leaves, Kevin has that feeling of loneliness. And he asks himself why. And it's because when he came to church, as welcoming as we were, as much love and grace as we lavished on Kevin, as much as we treated, put him before ourselves, whether it be in the food line or in conversation, Kevin wanted someone to share very deeply with about his walk with the Lord, how he came to know Christ. Kevin has so many wonderful things about the sermon, about what he was reading in his Bible, and he earnestly wanted to share them. And yet not one person asked Kevin about a spiritual state, about his walk with Christ. Kevin expected to have all these people who were very specifically right off the hop interested in his relationship with the Lord. And as much as we may have been, it appeared that we did not ask that first go. And so Kevin, even though he was surrounded by people, godly people, brothers in the Lord, Kevin still left feeling lonely. The expectation did not match up with what happened. And that is, that is loneliness, my friends. Loneliness is not the absence of people. It is when the, the community of God, when the church, when sometimes we don't do what God asks of us. Another aspect, and this is part of it, to loneliness, when we cannot fulfill the plan and purpose of God to our fullest extent, because the commands of God, the gospel has so much to do with people. There is a reason that Jesus Christ has come. There's a reason that he gathered 12 disciples. There is a reason that the church is as big and as diverse as it is. Because in order to obey God, we need people around us, both to love and to be loved by. So let's turn to Genesis chapter 2 and see where this whole bit of loneliness begins. Genesis chapter 2, verse 11, right at the front of our Bibles. Actually, start. I will start reading in verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
Skipping down to verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So how has God designed man? How has God made man and what is he supposed to do from the very beginning of time? Well, he's put him in Eden. Eden is this beautiful, perfect, lush, green place full of life, full of water, full of so much good food for eating, so many good trees for pruning. Such a good place to live and work and to care for what God has given Adam. There's not a weed in the garden. There's not a bit of portulaca to pull out of the ground. There is nothing wrong with this garden. It is perfectly designed by God. And Adam is the perfect person to go in that garden to work it and to care for it. But there's a command back in chapter 1. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Dear friends, a virgin can conceive, but a man cannot give birth. Adam cannot fulfill this commandment on his own. He needs a helper, which is exactly what God says in verse 18. It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him, which is where Adam, God leads all the animals in front of Adam. He names it cow, sheep, cockatoo, etc., etc., but there's nothing like Adam. A, a bird can do certain things, but cannot help Adam. A, a cheetah, a cow, whatever animal, is not capable of helping Adam, is not capable of helping Adam accomplish what God asks of him. Monkeys cannot prune trees. Um, birds cannot weed the ground. They cannot help Adam fulfill the purpose that God has for him. So he needs a helper like him, someone who's similar to him and thereby understands what Adam is, what Adam is and also his chief end, his goal, what he's commanded to do. This is why Eve is taken for man. This is why the rib that God takes is made into the woman, which is why Adam says, Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken from man. So get ready for some beautiful, beautiful theology. The Trinity, that timeless mystery. One God, three persons in which we do not confuse the substance or divide the persons in weird ways, which is a beautiful mystery. The Trinity parallels Adam and Eve's ideal. God has designed man and woman to live together and the larger body of Christ to live together and work together in a similar way to the Trinity. Now that sounds really strange and weird, so let's unpack it together. Do we remember the Gospel of John? Opening words of Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus Christ is the Word, the second person of the Trinity. Jesus talks all over John. I and the Father are one, not two, but one. They are one God. To use a technical term, they're one in substance. They're, they're one God. Two different persons, yes, the Father and the Son, but one God. Jesus does nothing he does not see his Father doing. He says nothing he does not hear his Father say. They are both one God, and they are both one in purpose. Jesus does nothing that the Father does not approve of. They both have one purpose. What is it? To glorify themselves, to bring mankind to salvation. Adam and Eve are kind of similar. Sure, Adam and Eve are two distinct persons. One sins, the other is led into sin. One is made, the other is made. They're two different people. But Eve is taken from man. She is literally made of the same stuff that Adam is. 
Same substance, if you want to say, but the same stuff Adam is. And they both have the command, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. God asks the same thing of the both of them, gives them the same command. So, therefore, they can fulfill the purpose that God has for them. If they do what men and women do, be fruitful and multiply, work the garden together. That is what they are supposed to do. That is how they fulfill the purpose of God, by working together to do his will and accomplish it. But we know that gets complicated. We know it's complicated by this factor, sin. This is where we see the start of loneliness. Because if we go to chapter 3 and we look at verse 7, after they eat the fruit that they should not, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife, what did they do? Hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And then the Lord asks a remarkable question. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Well, we know the answer, and so does God know the answer. Do you think our God, who made the very world, is not able of looking through a bush to see where Adam and Eve are hiding? Well, he is very, very capable. And he does know the answer. But when Adam and Eve sin against God, what do they believe about God? Well, they question God. Like the serpent says, did God really say that if you eat of the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die? Did he really say, or did he mean this? And, Adam, and Eve says, well, perhaps he did mean this. Perhaps I misinterpreted God. Perhaps he is not being trustworthy. Whatever the reason, Adam and Eve, God has revealed himself to be this way. Perfect, holy, never lying, always truthful, wanting the best for his people. Adam and Eve say, well, perhaps he's holding something back. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. And so we will trust the serpent who we stumbled across instead of the God who is clearly our God, our merciful Lord who gives us good things. So there we go. And what is the result? Well, they hide from God. they trying to cover themselves in fig leaves, trying to hide from the Lord, trying to hide their guilt, trying to hide their shame, and getting away from the God who loves them and knows them completely. They cannot hide from God, and nothing is hidden from God. And yet they try. And so what is the result of their sin? The result of their sin is not only isolation from God, and sin has tainted our understanding of God. Often we think, you know, Lord, if you loved me, if you were with me, you would help me stand this temptation, or you would make temptation less difficult. Lord, if you loved me, if you were with me, you would give me healing. You would give me whatever I desire. Lord, you're, you're keeping something from me. I don't feel my, like my life is fulfilling. You're, you're keeping something from me here. Sin twists how we view God, how he reveals himself to be, and then who we believe him to be, which unfortunately can sometimes be very different things, if not informed by this gift that we have. There's a key difference between knowing God and knowing about him. Key difference. And all loneliness, all loneliness is either a consequence of this very sin, original sin, which leads us to feel like God is not with us, which leads us to maybe question him. Or sometimes it's outright sin that isolates us. You know, we've had a fight with someone at church and we refuse to reconcile, so we don't come to church. We, we have a disagreement with one of our family members, so we stop coming for Thanksgiving and Christmas and Easter. We don't see eye to eye with someone on something, so rather than trying to come together, we part, part ways. 
And sometimes we're just angry and bitter and grumpy so people don't want to spend time with us. And then very much so, our loneliness is our own fault. But be very careful, my friends. Be very careful when you look at your own loneliness. May God give us wisdom and grace to discern. Lord, is it caused by some sin which I must repent of? Is it caused by envy or greed? Or me not reading your word and taking it as true? Or is it just caused by this original sin of Adam and Eve, where I am not responsible for being lonely this time? We need to be very careful. And as we carry on, we'll look at Psalm 22, and we will see how we can know that for sure. But here's a tough question. Was Jesus lonely? Was he lonely? Well, I, I have wrestled with this. It's, it's hard. So we'll, we'll go through some scripture to, together. We know that Christ is truly God. He is also truly man. Philippians chapter 2, verses 4 to 5 says, Yet he who being in very nature God, did not count equality with God as something to be grasped. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Jesus is truly God and truly man. He is no more God than he is man, and he is no more man than he is God. And let's, when we look at Jesus as a human being, having a human nature, Hebrews chapter 2 says that he was made like his brothers in every respect, that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Not only is he human, he understands what it means to be human, to have to live among sinful people and to be tempted in every way and yet be without sin. Jesus is just like us, except sinless. So when Christ feels lonely, and yes, our Savior felt lonely, he understands absolutely fully what it means, especially on the cross in Gethsemane. Imagine being among, serving for three years in your ministry among a group of people who never get the point or very seldom get the point, proclaiming that you're going to die and rise again on the third day and your disciples look at you puzzled, boggled. It doesn't make sense to them. And they say, surely you will not die, Lord. What will happen if you die? Your entire ministry and all you have worked for will fail. Peter, you are far too brave. Get behind me, Satan. Imagine working with people like that for three years. Imagine never being understood fully by anyone except your father, who you know is reigning and ruling, but you cannot see. Who will never come and physically wrap his arms around you and say, it's okay, Jesus. But you must rely on the grace and the confidence that comes from knowing God's word and knowing your father. Jesus did say on that cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The God who had been so near and so faithful to him felt distant, felt far away. So yes, did Jesus Christ feel lonely? Yes, he did. But what did he do in his loneliness? Was he alone on the cross? Did the Trinity tear itself asunder? so that Christ stood alone, separated and barred from his Father? The answer is no. No, 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 no. Will God ever forsake those he loves? Absolutely not. Psalm 9 verse 10 says this, Those who know your name will trust in you. For you, O Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Never Underline the never in your Bibles with red pen, with highlighter, with stars. Never. Never. And that's important because when Jesus Christ looks like he is the worst of criminals, cursed is everyone who hung on a tree, says the book of Deuteronomy. When he looks like he is cursed, when he looks like he has sinned, when he has suffered immensely and all the people around him say he has done deservedly so, except Pilate, who is somehow wiser, then what do we make of that? That Jesus, although he may feel lonely, he is not alone. By no means is he alone. 
So now let's, let's head back to Psalm 22 and look at what Christ meant upon the cross. Because when Jesus says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Out of Psalm 22, he wants us to look at the rest of the psalm, which is why we had the rest of the psalm read today. Because if we just take that little verse and hang it and say that's what Jesus meant, we miss the rest of it. Because Christ does not remain in the grave. Christ does not cry out in hopelessness. When he says other words on the cross, like, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, and it is finished, it gives us an indication that Jesus is not giving up. He is confident that God will keep his word. He is confident that God will accomplish his purpose despite the agony, despite the suffering, despite the pain that he is enduring. Verses 23 and 24, as was read for us, you who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. He has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. Because if Christ truly was forsaken, he would have remained dead. He would have remained in the grave. They would have found his body. And you and I gathering here today would be one of the most foolish, useless, and helpless things that we have ever done in our entire lives. But since Christ is raised, since his confidence that God will vindicate him is true, we have more hope than the entire world combined can muster. Christ has so much assurance that he will accomplish his purpose. Despite his sorrow, despite his loneliness, despite that it seems that no one understands him. He has had his grief seen. His father has seen his grief, his sorrow, his affliction, and has heard his cry for help. And Christ knows this from the word, from the word of God, from the words of his father. Even in the deepest anguish, Christ trusts God's word and he holds fast to it. And this is the battle of loneliness. Because when we are lonely, how often is it to get tracked into sin? How hard is it, easy is it rather, to get into self-pity? No one loves me. No one wants to spend time with me. What have I done wrong to warrant this? And does Jesus care about me when I'm lonely? There's a, a pastor in the States, his name is Paul David Tripp, he said something very wise. He said, you know, you are the person who knows yourself best because you talk to yourself the most. But how often do we need someone else to speak a little truth into our ears? How often do we need someone to poke us and remind us, you may be alone and you may, you may feel alone, you may feel lonely, but who is there with you? Jesus Christ. But we have a tendency to make a very small and helpless Jesus. You know, sure, the Lord is with me, but he is, he is little. He is not mighty to save. He is not surrounding, surrounding me with love and pouring grace onto me. He is but a small Jesus. He's a watercolor Jesus with those sort of far, far off eyes who never gets his hands dirty and who has never experienced what I have. Get rid of little watercolor Jesus. Get true, biblical, mighty Jesus who understands more than you and I can ever know. We can sort of understand what loneliness feels like in each other. Sort of. But there's one person who knows you through and through, and I pray you know him. That is the Lord Jesus, who has been tempted in every way, yet was without sin, who, as a perfect high priest, can sympathize with our weakness, and who knows the depths of our hearts. So how does Jesus' response to loneliness, how does that quote of Psalm 22 and that vindication on the third day when he rises, how does that help us, lonely people? How does that help us? Let's go through it together. First, Jesus and David, when he writes, admits his need and his circumstance. This is not a flowery psalm. 
I don't know if you have this tendency, but I have this tendency. Maybe it's something that men have every once in a while. You ask me how I'm doing. The answer is fine. The answer is there's nothing wrong. The answer is, oh, I'll get by. But my friends, if we never realize the depth of the problem, any solution will be quite surface level. You don't, when you have a house that has cracked foundations, you don't put new siding on. You don't make it look pretty. You don't address what is not important. You get down and you dig a new foundation and you pour the concrete and you move the house on it and say, now it's going to stay. Now the problem is fixed. Jesus and David admit the depth of their sorrow, the depth of their trouble. You don't say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me in anything less than the hardest and deepest of trouble. And just like Christ, David is mocked and forsaken. He trusts in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him, for he delights in him. Can you imagine the people you are trying to say, say that before you? The Pharisees did. The priests did. And I can't imagine what Christ would have thought. And it's hard to speculate. But perhaps, perhaps, it was something like this. That is exactly what I am doing for you. The Lord will deliver me and the Lord will vindicate me. May he give you eyes to see it as the people are mocking him. So he admits the trouble, but then he remembers the character of God. After the first three, two verses saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why do I cry to you? You don't answer. Verse three, here's the character of God. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel and you are fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued, and you they trusted and were not put to shame. That's what we have to remember, the character of God in our trouble. Because God has not changed despite how we feel. Um, I don't know if you ever saw those four spiritual laws tracks. They had this beautiful picture of a, of a locomotive and the tender and the caboose. And the locomotive was fact. The tender was faith. The caboose was feeling. The locomotive can very well survive without the caboose. It's not important. And it is the farthest thing away from what is most important. Feelings are not evil. They are good gauges, but they are bad guides. But the tender is faith. You can just peer atop all the coal and you know we're going somewhere. We need to be attached to fact. Faith is built on fact. It is not built on some something that cannot be proven. It is built on revealed fact in the word of God. So stay attached to it. Faith is attached to it. And that's exactly what David does here. And he also looks to salvation. This is the basic. This is remember the gospel, guys. This is remembered what Christ has done. And Jesus looks to his future salvation. He says, in a few hours more, I will be taken down and I will die and I will rise. That is the future salvation Christ looks forward to. And as a part of that, in verse 21, he says this, or verse 22, rather, I will tell of your name to the brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. All of that leads to this place of, I am going to proclaim the greatness of God. I'm going to proclaim the gospel. I'm going to proclaim salvation, despite how isolated I may be, despite how may sorrowful I feel, despite how it feels like all have left me and forsaken me, God is still with me, and there are still people around me, and I will proclaim his greatness to them. The same hope and confidence that Jesus has amidst his loneliness is the same solution we can use. But the other solution is the church. And we had a great example of that today when two godly women got behind this pulpit to proclaim the word of God together. Because when we are struggling, when we may feel lonely, or even if we just have difficulty, however big or small, the church of Jesus Christ must come together to strengthen, to build up, to encourage one another as long as it is called today. Because just as Adam needed Eve. Christ does not need his church, but in his love, he has taken her for himself. And every 
toe, every gallbladder, every arm, every ear is important to the body of Christ. And every other part of the body must help sustain life. Not to talk to our, our friends on the airwaves for too specifically, but praise the Lord that we've got our camera up today, that we can fellowship together in this way. But this is no replacement for being with the church. The church needs each other because all of our life comes from Christ who is the head. But what an aid it is to our walk with God, what a help to remember the truth and the actual reality of God's promises, that God's promise to be faithful is not just some ethereal vapor, but it's he will stick with me when I have someone I love close to me pass away. He will stick with me. He will prove that he will give me life and strength to face each day for his glory over long spans of time, over things of great difficulty. And the greatest way to combat that feeling of loneliness is to see the body of Christ in action. <sighs> to see it doing its job. And not just the church gathering together to have cocktails or to do something merely practical. Because, dear friends, I, I can tell you that there are churches in name only that can do seniors' teas and quilt sales ten times better than we can. Ten times better. And good for them. I will buy their quilts. I will drink their tea. But I will ask them to consider Jesus Christ. So much so. Christ is our new and better Adam. And although Christ needs no help in making disciples, he could do it far better than we do. But he also takes us as his bride, the church, for his own and says, let us do this together. Let us go and make disciples of every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, which comes with a promise of, lo, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. In obeying God together as a church, in focusing on his redemption and on his nearness, even in the depths of loneliness. We must come together as the church. And as, it is as we, blah, 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 forgive me. It is when we do that, that God says, yes, I will wholeheartedly remind you of my sustaining presence of the sanctifying work that God can do. It's a corporate solution. And the church is one of the beautiful ways we see the promises of God come to fruition because when you stand in a church, when you live in a church for 50, 60, 70 years, when you see people come and go, when you see marriages strengthened, when you see children come to faith, when you see people that you never thought would walk through that door come through that door again, then we can say, yes, the church is bearing fruit. God is helping us do what he has asked of us. And that cannot happen in isolation. You and I both know how many different commands there are that involve one another's. You cannot one another yourself. Sure, it sounds silly, but how many of us try to do that? Accomplish what God asks of us, flying solo. And then we say, well, I'm lonely because I failed. Come together with believers and confess to Christ because that grace that we need will bring us back from the outskirts of the garden right to the Lord. And not just, not just us, but with all the family of God. So now we can worship God properly. And more importantly, one day, as his people, we will all be with the Lord together. The promise of heaven is a very much a corporate thing. In my father's house are many mansions. Yes, but you don't, don't you think that you'll want to have your brothers over to fellowship with you in your portion that God gives to you? So my dear friends, the church must help each other. We also need to find those people that are lonely because often lonely people are not those who will ask for help. They won't cry out and say, come to me. Come read some scripture with me. Or let's go bowling in Lipton today. Let's get together and have some fun so we can get to talking about what matters, spiritual or temporal. With God's help, let us reach out as God does. 
Because there was a time when we were distant from the Lord, when we were aliens and strangers under the wrath of God. And we certainly were not going to turn around and march to the Lord and say, forgive me, unless he reached out his mighty hand from the darkest corner of the world, brought us into his marvelous light. Let's pray. Lord, thank you, thank you that you are our God, you are our Savior. Lord, if we trust in you, you will not put us to shame. You are rich in mercy. And Lord, although we have sinned, you call us back to you to confess, to repent, and to believe the gospel that you will receive us with open arms. Lord, we pray that you would give us wisdom and grace to remember your promises. Lord, may we not be governed by our feelings, but Lord, may we use them to praise you and express your greatness, to remember that you are with us to the very end of the age as we walk with you, as we walk with your church. Lord, I pray you would give us eyes to see and compassionate hearts for those that need, need a visit, those that need a call, those that need to be encouraged to come again to fellowship with believers, whether that be 10 or 100. Lord, help us not to forget how near you are to us because you have brought us near by the blood of Christ. Lord, we thank you for your love. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.